Sure, the official record reflects that Gordon Conway got two standing ovations <laughs> at this. <clears throat> and that, that, that was just incredible. Gordon, uh, we wish you Godspeed on your journey. Uh, tell Susan how much uh, we love her and miss her. And you always, you both always have the warmest welcome back at the World Food Prize. I have been the one who has benefited from your wise counsel. And uh, uh, Ismail, thank you so much for your eloquence and this dialogue. Let's have another round of applause. <clears throat> And that. So, um, you know, people ask me sometime, uh, well, how does, uh, you know, how, how do you get these panels? Where do they come from? Uh, what's the, what's the, the inspiration? And <clears throat> I find it's just kind of uh, standing around and listening that you uh, learn a lot. So this next panel is coming, uh, comes from Ahmedabad in India at the African Development Bank uh, annual meeting. Uh, that uh, our laureate Aki Nadashina held. And uh, I was kind of standing there, most of the crowd had filed out, and there were three or four people standing there talking about nutrition. And uh, one of them was uh, Her Excellency Gerda Verberg, who I knew from having spoken here at the World Food Prize when she was uh, Minister of Agriculture of the Netherlands. And Sean Baker was there. And, uh, and Rajul Panjalorch was there. And I just said to myself, well, this is an interesting uh, group. And they're talking about scaling up nutrition. And then when David Nabarro uh, received uh, 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 one of our laureates to uh, said, well, now we've got the core group. And then I had met Gunhild Stordeland at, uh, now, now I'm, I'm going out for a little, uh, at uh, Prince Charles's uh, residence at Buckingham Palace, uh, where I was at a, a conference. And, um, and Gunhill was to uh, come, but she couldn't. So uh, Sandro De Mayo is here. Sandro, thank you so very, very much. This is uh, nutrition rising to the challenge. And certainly we have on the stage five individuals who have been involved in that. Your Excellency Gerda, thank you for being here, making the long trip. The floor and the panel is yours. Thank you very much, Ambassador Quinn. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor and pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is indeed Gerda Verberg. I'm the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement. And it's not only David Nabarro who has a close relationship with the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, because he was there from the beginning in 2010. Uh, but also Laurence Haddad, he, who just escaped, but promised me that he will, he will be back. He's very busy these days, because being a laureate is something, but um, there's a lot to be done if you are a laureate, but it's an honor. But he's also a member of our executive uh, uh, committee. Sean Baker is involved, actually all the people on the panel are involved. And the challenge here tomorrow in, um, in discussion with you is how do we rise up to the challenge in nutrition, but also how do we make uh, a sound bridge between food and food production and consumption and nutrition? Because we need to answer the question, what can good nutrition do for your body and for your brains, for your physical development and opportunities, but also, also for your cognitive development. And the Sun Movement uh, um, is a movement that is driven by countries, 60 countries right now, and I'm extremely uh, honored that the jury of the World Food Prize has selected two, two of these eminent laureates because they are uh, fully involved in, uh, in good nutrition and how to get it, get it done and how to make the right connection and how to create hope and uh, opportunities for all people involved, leaving no one behind. 
two years ago, the world food price started already by appointing uh, a, a laureate who also was involved in biofortification. Last year, it was the president of the African Development uh, Bank, uh, President uh, Adesina, uh, Adesina, and this year it is um, David Nabarro and Laurence Haddad. Great, great choice. I'm honored to uh, moderate this panel, and my proposal is to do it as follows. I'll ask David Nabarro and after him all the panelists to um, give a contribution, speak from the heart if possible, uh, of three minutes in which they answer what is important to make, to include in all you do, uh, good nutrition and how uh, do we do it. So I'm happy to give the floor to David Nabarro for his three minutes. Thank you very much, Gerda. Good day to everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by just sharing with you something that came through at the end of that remarkable uh, lecture and then fireside chat where uh, Gordon and Ismail were sitting together. Gordon pointed out that the direction that the Malabo Montpellier panel has moved in has led them to produce one very important report two years ago, titled Nourished. And though there you have an agriculture panel recognising and setting out very clearly that nourishment of people is solidly linked to the food that they are able to access. And taken a little bit further, that means that we need to recognise food, all of us, as being important because it is the fundamental source of nourishment for human beings. And I think for many of us sitting in this room, that is blindingly obvious. But unfortunately, in actual practice, those who work on agriculture and food sometimes need to be helped to recognise that their work is also key to determining whether or not populations are able to be adequately nourished. And that becomes more and more important as we come to terms with the reality, as you will hear in this panel, that so much of human experience is determined by the nutrition that people have, especially early on in their lives, but it continues right through. To help us get into this new way of thinking, there's one other departure that's turned out to be necessary, and that is to view food not as a commodity, but as an ongoing product of multiple systems that occur in society. Again, we saw it in Gordon's lecture. That lovely picture he had that showed the rice field as part of a human ecosystem. And so when we talk about food and describe food systems, we're talking about the relationships between the various factors that determine how food arrives and goes towards the plates from which we all eat and then determines whether or not we are nourished. But if we're going to work well on food systems and see them as the source of nourishment, we also need to be able to embrace the variety of actors that are key to making those food systems work. And that's where connecting people together from different professional groups, from different sectors and among different stakeholders becomes key, not easy. And so perhaps my last comment in this opening piece is the importance of ensuring that everywhere those who are involved in the production of food, processing of food, marketing of food, distribution of food, 
ensuring that food is actually given to people when they need it, often the carers who do that work, that all those people are enabled to become together for dialogue, for discussion, for debate, because it's quite challenging to get that link between production through to consumption from the farm or the fishing ground to the mouth to get that relationship so that it really does contribute to good nutrition for everybody. Thank you very much. So food is about connection. Connection between, between people, co collaboration between, between people, and making sure that good food is not only fueling you, but also bringing you together and making sure that your body and your mind uh, can do a good job and that is nourishing you. Sandro De Maio, please, what, is your, what are your, is your answer to the what needs to be done and how does it need to be done? Yeah, thanks, Gerda. And I can't agree more of the importance of cross-disciplinary and multidisciplinary, um, cross-sector and multi-sectoral approaches. And we've heard from the incredible fireside chat that we were privileged to listen to just now, and also um, David, and congratulations again, David, on the award, and also Lawrence, um, of the importance of this. But one of the challenges of working across sectors is that we need to have a common departure point. We need to share a common language and a common understanding. So I want to paint that uh, for a moment as a, as a starting point for this panel. Where are we now and where does the food system sit in the many challenges that our global community faces? Um, if we look at climate change, if we look at the ecological challenges facing humanity today, there was an important paper in Nature this week that very clearly stated uh, our food system is now the number one leading sector for greenhouse gas emissions the number one sector for, fresh, fresh, for the use of fresh water, uh, the number one sector, the leading sector for deforestation, contributing to deforestation and ecosystem loss, and of course, phosphor and, phosphorus and nitrogen, which as a medical doctor is new language to me, but very much the home turf of you in the audience. And then it's uh, flow on effects through eutrophication and runoff that have um, enormous consequences for the planet. But then from a health perspective, uh, it's also, again, at the core of many of our global challenges. Two billion people are now overweight or obese, while 830 million uh, and rising uh, for the first time in decades go hungry every evening, and around two billion are micronutrient deficient or uh, lack key vitamins and minerals that are so crucial for their not just physical and health, but also economic and intellectual development across their life course. And with this, we also see the rise of what we call the double burden, the coexistence of multiple and contrasting forms of malnutrition. Indonesia, one example, mid-30s uh, of, of uh, a prevalence continuing of stunting, and yet in adult women, a rising, or across the age groups, a rising rates of overweight and obesity. But then, importantly, the interconnected, interconnectedness of these through the food system. Because if we just look at human nutrition and climate change, we know that, again, I've just said world hunger is on the rise once again for the first time in decades due to conflict and climate change, Con geopolitical conflict, which is very much driven by volatile food prices and insecurity in food, uh, uh, food supply. And of course, climate change, which is driven to a large degree by our food system. So the interconnectedness of these through our food system and the food that we do or do not eat, how we grow and consume and process and waste is so critical uh, to many of these challenges. But then where are we going to be by 2050 if we, take, if we continue to take a business as usual approach? Well, all of the evidence suggests that we'll be going in exactly the wrong direction. If we just look at the climate markers that I mentioned, greenhouse gas emissions are expected to almost double. Uh, phosphorus and nitrogen use, water use and land use to increase by about 50 to 70% on 2010 levels, which are already on track to go far beyond what our current planet can sustain. And yet we need to continue to drive billions out of poverty and give them anywhere near the opportunities to live a life like we have today. So the interconnectedness, but also therefore the opportunities that lie in, in, in addressing many of these very large challenges through food and through our food systems. 
There are three take-home opportunities, though, that again emerge from our food system and very much sit in the agricultural space more than the global health space. Global health and the malnutrition that we see is more of an outcome, but the opportunities for solutions lie very much in the agricultural sector. Um, the first is shifting populations to healthy diets. But, and very often we look at, we think, we think of straight away reducing our meat consumption. And for many people on the planet, in our parts of the world, that will be the case. But actually it's also about what we don't grow as much as what we do grow or grow or make too much of. And it's about ensuring that we can produce enough of the fresh, healthier foods that we need to to power healthier diets, particularly in low and middle income countries, emerging markets around the world. The second is the vital use or inve further investment in technology to ensure that uh, key issues like phosphorus and nitrogen are able to be recycled, re recycled reutilized, and used appropriately um, and kept in uh, the food system. And last is to look at the critical issue, issue of food loss and waste. It's a, it's a shocking statistic that yet still today in the world, one third of food is wasted. Uh, in many low and middle income countries, this is pre-market food that never makes it to the market or the supermarket or the home. In, parts, in, in wealthier parts of the world, it's uh, at or after market. And if we can make uh, investments, if we can make uh, significant strides across these three areas, shifting diets, all of the supply and demand mechanisms that we will need across sectors to achieve that, uh, investing in technologies like those that we see outside right here today, and lastly, addressing the critical issue of food loss and waste, we can go a long way to achieving the SDGs and importantly, uh, feeding an entire planet of 9.5, 9.7 billion people with, uh, in a way that they deserve by mid-century and having a planet to continue to live on. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Quite an agenda, but it has to be done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, looking around, I see that some of you are taking notes, which is great, because we have two panelists to go who will give their what and how to connect uh, food, agriculture, uh, and, and better nutrition. Um, and then I'd like to give the floor to you to come forward with questions or remarks or suggestions or whatever. And I've identified at least already two microphones, so uh, be prepared because we want to interact with you. Rajul, please give us your three minutes of what and how do we get the connection uh, right and how do we reach good nutrition for those who are malnourished, undernourished, hungry. Uh, for a thousand days, but also the rising number of obese um, and illness or, or uh, overweight nutrition-related uh, diseases. You have the floor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gerda. Three minutes to solve all these problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me answer, let me ask the question, are we rising to the challenge? And I would say yes, we are. Uh, we are seeing in the last five to 10 years some major policy developments globally, regionally, nationally. We are seeing some major investments. We are seeing coalescings of groups coming together. But are we rising enough to the challenge? And I would say no. I would say we are seeing hunger and undernutrition stagnating. We are seeing overweight obesity rising. We need to speed up the progress. We need to accelerate the progress. And I will put four accelerators, potential accelerators on the table for us. Accelerator number one, policy. We see successes. We see some interesting policies, innovative policies being developed. We need more policy innovation. We need more courageous policies and courageous policy makers who are willing to cross boundaries to develop policies. We see great examples of innovation and courage in Bangladesh, in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, in Peru. How can we have more of these and how can we sustain these? Two policy challenges I put on the table will be how do we find ways to reduce the cost of nutrient-dense foods? We have invested a lot of policies in staple foods not enough in nutrient-dense foods. How do we find a way to lower the cost? Second policy challenge is how do we generate demand for consumer demand for nutritious foods? 
we can produce nutritious foods, how do we generate demand? That is policy accelerating one. Second accelerator I want to put on the table is program accelerator. We are seeing more multi-sectoral action. We need to see even more of that. How do we incentivize agencies and implementers to cross boundaries as they uh, invest in their programming? And here I want to put on the table um, the um, uh, findings that we are getting from our research about behavior change communication. More and more of the work we are seeing is the importance of integrating behavior change communication in programming. Third accelerator is technology. We have already heard here about biofortification. We have heard of many technologies. How do we bring together and invest in technologies that will allow us, again, to accelerate and to scale up? There was a very interesting session this morning on scaling up. And I think some of the lessons from there are very critical for us. How do we scale up the, not just the generation, but the application and the use of technology that will lead to acceleration of progress? And the fourth accelerator I'd like to put on the table is investment. Innovative financing to again accelerate progress and take up. Investment in people. We need capacity. We need leadership. We can have technologies, but if we do not have the capacity to use them effectively, again, we are halfway there. And the last one will also be knowledge. We need to accelerate the generation of evidence that we can use to design policies and of data to help us know, are we accelerating or are we stagnating? Thank you very much. Thank you. Quite an agenda. We will discuss this. Sean Baker, he is uh, from the Gates Foundation, but he was already introduced uh, to you. Sean, um, what should be the agenda and how do we meet the challenges? There are a few challenges. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, my first reflection as I was looking out into the room, I'm used to being in conferences where I think I know about 90% of the participants. What's exciting to me about this is that I might know probably less than 10% of the participants. And I think that's so important because nutrition needs you. Uh, we are not gonna resolve the challenges of undernutrition without the ag sector stepping up in a big way and differently. Uh, and so welcome to the nutrition family. I know you've always felt you're here and we want to make you feel even more part of that. And I think the recognition of the leadership this year of two of the global nutrition leaders is a huge under, vote of understanding of how essential it is that ag and nutrition work together. Um, I then actually wanted to build on, Rajul, one of your points about the cost of a nutritious diet. And I think as nutritionists, we often come in with social and behavior change communication. But you need to step back and just think, well, why are we concerned about this? Why are we obsessed about the cost and affordability, availability of nutritious foods. And let me talk with infants and young kids. The first six months is great. Breast milk is meeting all the nutrient requirements. For, in six to 23 months, it's a critical period because we need to make sure in complement to breast milk, we're meeting those infants and young kids need. And anybody who's fed an infant knows the gut's really tiny. So it's actually incredibly high quality, dense in energy and dense in nutrients. Because otherwise, you're filling up the gut, but in fact, with basically empty calories or empty volume. So, but if you look at the data globally, with a rather imperfect indicator of minimal acceptable diet in low and middle income countries, only 17%, 17% of infants and young children, six to 23 months, are getting a minimal acceptable diet. So I can come in with great behavior change communications, but if that mom cannot afford a nutritious food for her baby, we're not being serious. And I, as a nutritionist, can't make that food more, accept more affordable. Only the ag sector and the, the uh, food processing sector can do that. So your role is fundamental. And to put again that in, into context, you know, the, the, the other thing I think is incredibly important that struck me, in fact, 
we are all serving the same people because it is actually the smallholder farmers whom you've all dedicated your lives to serving who are the families the most at risk of malnutrition. And this malnutrition is in fact tying them in to a vicious cycle of poverty because we know it's those malnourished kids who grow up with less abilities and in fact, we're just trapping them into this cycle of poverty. So in fact, we are coming together by serving fundamentally the same populations. And we also know that it is the people, the lower you are in your, your socioeconomic quintile, the higher proportion you're spending on food stuff. I was looking at data from Nigeria, the fifth income quintile, over 82% of people in that quintile are spending 75% or more of their income on food. So making sure that they can actually then use part of that to buy a more nutritious food becomes incredibly difficult. But somebody, even in the fourth income quintile, so not even the poorest of the poor in Nigeria, I'm communicating to that mom, look, feed an egg to yourself and to your child every day. She would have to spend 44% of her income, 44 just to buy one egg. So without partnerships with the ag sector to make sure that nutritious foods are available and affordable, and then layering on, as Rajul Yud said, effective behavior change, we're not going to be able to break this vicious cycle of malnutrition and poverty. At the same time, and I'll come back to it, we have seen success. And I think we don't want to walk away with just seeing the challenges, but also seeing, in fact, we have risen to the challenges and we can do even more. And that's what gives me the most hope. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, four perspectives and they can all come together and they have to come together. But we'd like to hear from you. I've seen two microphones, maybe there are more. Is there somebody who wants to take the mic? Please say your name and make your point very clear. And Crisp, are many students in the room here? I think I see some of them and I'd like to hear your ambitions and your views and your questions uh, as well, please. Sir, you have the floor. And my proposal is that we take three or four uh, questions and that you can address your question. Do you want to ask David Tamparo, Rajul, Sean Baker, Sandro De Mayo? Who? Yeah, I think it's probably a question for everybody. Uh, uh, sorry, go. sorry to go this direction on you. Yeah. Uh, Jim Gaffney with Corteva AgriScience. There seems to be a uh, chorus of proponents saying we need to reduce animal agriculture and meat consumption for uh, climate change reasons. Uh, at the same time, if you look at most of the reports coming out of the world, especially in low and middle income countries, meat consumption, dairy, egg consumption, is increasing fairly rapidly uh, and it is also one of the ways for smallholder farmers to come out of poverty. So where do we go from here? Thank you. I think you have an opinion. What's I, your opinion? So, so my opinion is, <laughs> is that if we're looking at helping smallholder farmers and we're looking at improving nutrition Animal agriculture is one of the ways to do both. Okay. Um, I address this, this question first to Sandro de Mayo and maybe also Sean, but we, go, we continue because, as I said, I'd like to have uh, four questions. Madam, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Claire Thorpe. I'm the executive director of the International Life Sciences Institute for North America. And this, the topic of this discussion is rising to the challenge. And the speakers have talked about the importance of engaging all players and stakeholders within the food chain and joining it up. It's a very complex food chain. The challenge I'd like to talk to, to speak to and to ask the panel about is how do we do this effectively? Because my organization conducts research in the public health interests, but we're funded by industry. We conduct our research using a tripartite model, so we engage government and academic and industry scientists. And what I find from this position, and also having worked in industry associations before, and having worked in government, and having worked as an academic, is that when you start bringing industry into the fold, you become a target. People want to marginalize it, dismiss it, they want to tarnish the reputation of it, and they make it increasingly difficult for industry to engage. I would like the 
to ask the panel how they propose we overcome the naysayers and we enable industry to participate in what is often foundational research in a manner which enables it to be used and contribute to okay, this yeah. challenge. Thank you so much. It's not only, it's not only your question, but I propose how do we bring the right stakeholders to the to uh, the table and how do we prevent exclusion or marginalizing of the private sector that we need yeah. um david nabarro i think this really is a question for you and maybe also for the others i go to the to the second year madam you and then you sir and then we Hope to have a second round of questions. Madam Yu, Thanks. please. Hi, my name is Christine Rock. I'm a student from Kansas State University, and I have a question about policy. Um, you mentioned that, that that's an important component of strengthening nutrition-based efforts, but I wonder what makes those policies effective, if it's the wording, the implementation, the resources that are involved. Um, so just more about policy. I would love to know some more Thank specific examples. Rajul, that's a question for you. Sir, please. Uh, Ted Shire with Jet PHC, work on diabetes prevention and reversal. Uh, just have a was wondering about your thoughts in terms of strategy in nutrition. If you focus on uh, reversal of diabetes and obesity, which form uh, kind of a central component of diet-driven disease, uh, if you focus on those two, you can help all the other diet-driven diseases. And was wondering if you could share your thoughts on on strategy. Yeah. Thank you very much. I see one nodding, but I, I know at least there are two who, uh, who would like to give an answer here. But let me first uh, take a first round of answers, and please do it in a very summarized yep. way. The meat question. Let me very quick. I think this, um, there are three things that I think we should think about when we're answering this question. The first is the danger of an aggregated global um, sort of view that we often make these statements that are very simple, very easy to understand, but come at the cost of nuance. And whether it's the private sector, or whether it's meat, I think they're both great examples of that, where the discussion become, can become um, sort of very superficial, and it becomes the world needs to eat less meat. And that's simply not true. Uh, what is true is that we need to be uh, eating, consuming meat in different ways, we need to be producing it in different ways, and we need to be, rather than just focusing on quantity, we need to be focused on quality and equity. Uh, Sean talked very much about uh, the importance of greater uh, animal-based proteins in many low- and middle-income countries, and even in subpopulations, young women um, in low- and middle-income countries, for example, criti of critical importance to achieving sustainable development over the next 30 years, uh, or even the next 12. But there are big parts of the world that need to eat less meat and eat less poor quality meat. So the first is the danger of the aggregated view. The second is to focus on the quality of what we produce and how we produce it. But thirdly also, often the discussion falls to what we shouldn't be eating instead of what we should. And the global burden of disease data as well as the Nature paper this week both clearly say we're not producing enough fruit, vegetables, legumes, pulses, nuts and seeds to feed the global population a healthy diet and to keep within planetary boundaries. So I think the conversation needs to be as much about what we need to grow more of as it needs to be what we need to improve the quality of. Uh, maybe, it, it, yeah, I'll okay, stop, sorry. Okay, 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 let's try to brief them. No, 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 there's a lot of uh, richness uh, in this. David Nabarro, how do we get um, the right stakeholders to, to the table and how do we prevent ourselves from just Okay, thank you very much indeed. It, it is my view that I've built up over the years that to advance in the area of nutritious food, every concerned stakeholder should be at the table for the discussion. Farmers are business people. Food processors are business people. Marketeers are business people. Business should be inside the discussion chamber, should never be shut out on discussing how to move forward with nutritious food for everybody. The one area, just really important this for you from Ilse, the one area that I would say, Claire, where business should stay away is when standards are being set about what is the right food for people to eat. And the standard setting organisations are usually inside the health sector and they should be left to get on with their standard setting. But then when it comes to implementation, 
Business has a key role. Thank you very much. Raju, how do we get effective policies and how do we make them work? An excellent question. Maybe three parts to that very quickly. One is to design effective policies. And there the role of knowledge, evidence, stakeholder consultation, all of that very important. Second part is the implementation of effective policies, uh, Im implementing policies to be effective. It's sufficient resources, sufficient capacity, sufficient review to adjust the policies as needed. And the third part is policies, good policies are not isolated. They're part of an enabling environment and how do you create that culture where policies are valued and then policy is our resource for effective implementation requires good leadership, governance and champions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very, um a very good uh, answer, but I, from, from, from my perspective as a former Minister uh, of Agriculture and Food Quality, likes to add something. And I'd like to emphasize what Roger said in the panel before. We need researchers uh, and, and people coming up with policy advice to understand the political economy and to talk the language of not only farmers, but also the language of uh, civil servants and influencers in order to make sure that a policy will follow also the uh, proposals and recommendations of the researchers and the scientists. So this is uh, something for the students to understand, but it was already emphasized by Roger. Sean, do you feel comfortable to answer the final question? Otherwise you are... You have a double duty in the okay. second round. Okay, I was, I was going to reflect on two questions, if okay. I may, quickly. So I was going to come back to the animal source food issue. To me, it's, in fact, it's perhaps fundamentally a question of equity. Last night I was at a reception. I probably had enough meat products to satisfy my requirements for at least a month. I didn't need that much animal source food. It's not the smallholder woman farmer in Burkina Faso who is increasing her flock size from five hens to 50 hens that's driving the issues. And so it's really right, the right amounts for everybody who needs it and how with this wealth of animal source foods, how do we actually share it more equitably? There is, it's clear that for the population suffering under nutrition, animal source foods at affordable and appropriate levels are clearly part of the solution. Um, I would perhaps, when it comes to the private sector, I would echo, I think, uh, David's comments, which is not, it's, okay. it's no in longer a question. Oh. In that case, I would like uh, Cut me to, off. To, put, yeah, to put a full stop here, because I'd like to so you have a second round. Sure. And I'd like David to uh, answer, and you will, uh, you will have uh, an opportunity. The, the diabetes, no, 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 but if you, <laughs> if you will, agree, will agree or echo uh, David's remark, could you uh, re respond to the, to the question about diabetes? Do you have a oh, response? Oh, diabetes, sir? I don't know. Yeah, no, 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 David. Thank you very much indeed. No, if, if not, I will ask. I, yeah, think, yeah. I think I'd like to defer. I mean, I'm very interested in the diabetes question. It's quite challenging. Um, and I would just like to personally say that for me, the big epidemic for the future is type 2 diabetes. Uh, when I travelled to 53 countries last year on a, on a campaign, the one thing I found in going to hospitals was just the extraordinary number of people who are in hospital beds in Latin America, Middle East, Asia, and now increasingly in Africa, experiencing complications of type 2 diabetes, some of which are tragic. So the absolute emphasis on uh, preventing and ideally reversing type 2 diabetes that you described is something I would prioritize. Thank you very much. Second round, and I don't, I'm not sure that we can, can take uh, every question, but let's give it a try. Sir, you, and then you are the other side, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm F Fernando Barros from uh, the Forum of the Future that's led by Mr. Alison Polinelli. Uh, to tell you first, that since 2015, uh, Brazilian researchers, uh, led by Embrapa and in Indian universities, have developed a, a sustainable neutron carbon uh, system for producing beef. And they have a lot of lack of support and comprehension. It's not anymore a, a, a challenge. It's a, a, not, a, not even an experiment. 14 million hectares works producing beef 
without impacting producing of uh, uh, gases. So what uh, is your point, sir? The point is, why don't we support solutions for to produce meat instead reducing it, producing meat in carbon neutral basis? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Why don't we invest more in producing meat in carbon neutral, in a carbon neutral way? Sean Baker, you can already digest uh, the question. Um, Hi, David uh, Beckman from Bread for the World. And I'd like a to ask David and maybe you, Gerta, how do we uh, organize the effective clamor we need all over the world to uh, continue and accelerate the really remarkable progress we've made against uh, child malnutrition over the last decade? Thank you very much, David Namaro. This one is for you. Sir, Hi. please. Federal scientist from the um, University of Florida. I was taught by, by a Ghanaian um, health, uh, health expert, Dr. Uh, <clears throat> Boateng, that you actually need meat because it has the highest concentration of iron in the small stomachs of young babies. Uh, and this, <clears throat> this uh, my, my question to you is, uh, is this correct? And if so, what are we doing about it? Sandra De Mayo, this one is for you. Madam, please. Hi, um, my name is Gracie Pekarsik. From, I'm a student at Pennsylvania State University. Um, my question is related to urban areas and um, those. Slowly. Oh, but sorry. Yeah. <laughs> my question is related to urban areas and those areas like more far removed from the farm and how um, what feasible changes can be implemented to address proper like utilization and access to nutritious foods in areas of that, and that's also related to like the obesity and diabetes um, concerns. Yeah. Thank you very much. I understood your question, the relation between rural and uh, urban areas and the growing disbalance. What do we do about it? Raju, I think that's one question for you. Um, I think we can make it. Yes, sir, you and then uh, you and then I come back and then we have all the questions from the room. Please. Uh, Suzanne Nielsen at Purdue University. Raju, you were obviously at the scale-up session that we had this morning, and I wonder what came to mind. A couple of things that came to mind to you is uniquenesses with regard to the challenges in scaling up nutrition programs. Yes, thank you so much. I think I ask Sean and David to reflect a little bit on this scaling up. Madam, please. Thank you. Nabiha Kazi with No Wasted Lives. You're right, Sean, we've had great success and, and we know that we've made improvements on child survival on stunting, but we're still seeing 50.5 million kids with uh, acute malnutrition. Our obesity overweight numbers are also on the rise and these often coexist in the same communities in the same household. And I think while collectively we want to address all three, we're not quite there. So my question, and Gerda, feel free to weigh in on this as well, but certainly for Sean and David, is how do we make the financing mechanisms, both domestically and internationally, work better so we're addressing the spectrum of malnutrition in all of its forms? Thank you. I'll give my answers afterwards because it's not in my contract to answer questions uh, today here. <laughs> Please, sir. Yes, my name's Tom Steele. I work with Adesia. We're a manufacturer of therapeutic foods. Similar to the last two questionnaires, um, folks who've asked questions, very similar. When it comes to severe acute malnutrition, we have a tool in our toolbox that's proven time and time again to be effective, and that's therapeutic foods, ready-to-use therapeutic food, in combination with community-based management of acute malnutrition. Yet, less than 20% of those children with severe acute malnutrition are receiving this life-saving treatment uh, annually. Why? You know, I've worked in this field for 10 years, and I still can't wrap my head around why is the uh, access rate so low. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Seven questions, and we have exactly one minute per panelist to uh, answer. And I <laughs> start with Sean. No, 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 they're prepared. Uh, they're so experienced. Sean, your final minute in this panel. And so I get to pick and choose the question. Yes. So I'll try to respond to scale and uh, severe acute malnutrition and you know, it may have a flavor of finance. So um, I think to scale, one of the hard choices, because within the nutrition uh, suite of solutions, there are a number of arrows. 
And when you start going to scale, you actually are faced with a really difficult choice of what do I focus on? And so not making it everybody has to do everything for everybody everywhere. But what are the few things the health sector can do? What are the few things the ag sector can do? Do them well and do them at scale. And to me, that discipline of trading off, of understand how do we make it the minimal package that will have impact, who's responsible, where, so that it's focused on the most vulnerable populations, and do it at quality, and then build that up over time is perhaps the most important thing. Within that, reflecting on severe acute malnutrition, my hypothesis is that since that came out of the humanitarian field, sort of the development sector and the development sector working with the strengthening health systems didn't take it seriously. And I think most of the burden of severe acute malnutrition is actually in, non, actually in non conflict settings. So until we get this as just one of these core services that's a non negotiable in the health system in countries with burdens of acute malnutrition and it's integrated into the supply chains, et cetera, we're not going to move forward. Okay, thank you very much. Raju. Okay. On the urban, there is very little work out there on urban food security and nutrition. IFPRI is developing a research program on that under the leadership of Marie Ruel. It is very difficult to get financing to support that work. And I will just ask everyone, we look around, we look at what are the big evolving trends, urbanization, we better get ready to understand the dimensions, the scale, the scope, the opportunities, invest in urban food security and nutrition programming. On the effective clamor, I know it's a question for David, but I want to come in. We need to find a way to engage youth. They are the ones who will effectively clamor. We need to figure out exactly your point, Gerda. How do we talk their language and get them to embrace this issue? Thank you. Thank you, Rajul. Sandro, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and respond quickly to the three questions. So the first is around the issue of um, the quality of meat production and to answer, I think a lot is being done and a lot is being invested in trying to find ways, uh, not just in the forms that you talked about, but also looking at specific breeds, feed types, of reducing the uh, carbon intensiveness of meat production um, and across the, 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 the full supply chain of um, particularly red meat. So um, I think a, a lot is happening here in addition to then looking after market, how do we reduce, uh, look at meat alternatives, but much lower tech, uh, solutions like uh, meat mixes. Um, there's a great example in a very large scale uh, examples across Europe and America now of mixing red meat with mushroom uh, to create 50% um, uh, beef burgers that taste exactly the same. So not just in the, in the production, but also um, at the uh, market uh, solutions. The second is around meat in young people. Um, Sean is probably better qualified uh, as well, but certainly from a medical, a medical perspective and having just left WHO, clear, the evidence is very clear. Zero to six month old children breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding is the best for the child. Uh, it also has many benefits for the mother, e even relating to the um, issues of overweight and obesity. Um, complementary feeding in the first 24 months of life. Um, there currently are no up-to-date global guidelines on this. WHO is working on them. The World Health Organization is working on them and they should be out in the next few years, funded by, in fact, the Gates Foundation. Um, and, and I think... Um, Point. Yeah. If you want. But, but I'm not aware of any evidence specifically around uh, the importance of meat as such in the first 24 months of life, but certainly the importance of animal-based proteins is critical. Yeah. Just wanted to say that. And the last is um, the double burden is a, is a huge challenge facing the global community, not just in the population or the household, but here in the US in the individual. Obesity with micronutrient deficiency, increasingly common in our uh, calorie dense, nutrient poor diets. So looking at what we call double duty actions, actions that we know can be utilized, deployed to address overweight, obesity and diet related NCDs, including diabetes and undernutrition. Um, a great example is again, breastfeeding. It's, it's critically important for addressing both undernutrition and rising rates of overweight obesity in children children and in the mother. Okay, thank you very much. And last but certainly not least, David Navarro. Thank you very much indeed. Let us just be clear, all of us, that bad nutrition is a handicap. And if it happens early in life, it is a handicap throughout your life. 
and it needs attention. It's actually a needless injustice, as you've heard. There are ways, very, very inexpensive ways to prevent it. And if our food systems are somehow contributing to that needless injustice, then it needs political action from governments joined up with the efforts of business, civil society and science. Governments only act if people demand action. They demand action on security, on migration, on terror. But millions more people are affected by the injustice of malnutrition than are affected by terror. And yet there's much less political attention and money that goes into this injustice. So we have to redouble our efforts to make sure that clamour reaches the ears of decision makers and it's starting to happen. That's why we created the Scale Up Nutrition Movement. And we see presidents and prime ministers all over the world, not perhaps here but elsewhere, saying this is an injustice we will not tolerate. That's how we get the clamour. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I think we agree we had a great panel. And uh, though it is not in my contract, um, I'd like to say a few more words because um, adding to what the panelists said, let me summarize it in, uh, in this way. Um, talking about nutrition is talking about people from di different backgrounds. Bring them together and make them work together and you will sort out it is fun. Because you, dis you, and you discourage that those people are uh, involved but from a different uh, perspective and it is very very good and exciting to talk to them. Secondly, let's not talk about, about what you should not do anymore but let us talk about what you can do because it's much more encouraging for people if you are encouraged what to do and not that you only have to live with I don't, I'm not allowed, I cannot eat this, I, I shouldn't do that. That's not, that's keeping us, us um, that, keeping us, that, keep it, that is keeping us lock, locked and it shouldn't uh, happen. And last but certainly not least, um, with my own political experience, put it on the agenda of politicians, that they need to look into food production, in food consumption, into nutrition, into health-related uh, issues. It is there, but ask them what their program is, and once they are elected, uh, hold them to account. So that's emphasizing and even uh, making it louder what David Navarro said. It's about time and we need political leadership to bring change, but it doesn't mean that all of us shouldn't step up, step up already right now. Thank you very much for your attention and we are here to continue this talk. Thank you.